I'm so excited that we have two podcasts with my good friend, Victoria Felkar. She's an amazing scientist and researcher focusing all on female hormones, menstrual cycle, uh, menstrual cycle irregularities, uh, females and steroids, so many different things that not a lot of people are covering. And she is hands down the most influential person right now in our industry and one of the people that I trust the most when it comes to females and hormone research. Uh, there's not a lot of people out there and there's a lot of crazy information. So I'm so happy that Victoria could join us. I wanted to include this separate intro because I did initially record this for my YouTube channel, but I wanted to put it on the Team Local Fit Roundtable as well so that you guys could get access to it. So the first episode is going to be all about menstrual cycle health and then the second one is going to be all about birth control. So I really hope that you guys enjoy this and please make sure to check out Victoria's website because there's a bunch of great information on there as well. Hey y'all, we are back with Victoria Felkar. I'm not going to do the whole long introduction, but she is amazing. Um, Wicked Smart Chick, we actually did the introduction on the last podcast, um, so or podcast slash video, whatever medium you're watching this on, um, and so you can go check that out so we will kind of spare you all those details. But trust me when I say that she's super smart and amazing. And the last episode that we did was all about just kind of menstrual health in general. Um, and she's one of the most qualified people, in my opinion, to talk about that. And one of the most people qualified people to talk about this topic, which is all about birth control. Now, we are not going to be able to cover all of the ins and outs. Of course, this is an incredibly nuanced topic. Um, but we do want to kind of touch on, you know, the basics, like there's different types of birth control, um, you know, what to kind of expect when you're on, what does that mean? What does that look like for your body? And then if you are coming off, you know, kind of what is going on there. So kind of the pros, cons, everything in between, and just kind of what to expect, um, because it is something that Victoria has been studying for the past several years. And this is not something that honestly, a lot of people, in my opinion, are super qualified to talk about. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who just kind of brush it aside is like, oh, it's just kind of no big deal. And then there's also people who like really, really demonize this and don't really have a like a leg to stand on because they aren't necessarily as informed either. Um, and there's a lot of kind of fear mongering in that area, just kind of like anything, you know, with science, there's always the extremes. There's always a like, yeah, it's fine. And then there's always like, Oh my gosh. Right. And it's, so we're not going to get into all those ends, but we're just going to talk about here kind of the very, very informed person who, you know, does a ton of research on this and has worked with lots and lots of people. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what is going on? So Victoria, <laughs> Thank you for that. That was yeah. such an amazing introduction, part two. Um, <laughs> I'm getting better so, at these, all right? <laughs> you're, no, you're doing awesome, honestly. You're doing awesome. I love the podcast, remember? I, I, I hear all, all ends of the spectrum. But, uh, okay, so, I mean, con so terminology is important here, I guess, before we even get into, like, the ins and the outs and everything else. So yeah. what we're going to be talking about is their contraceptives. And so contraceptives, for the most simplistic way to talk about them, is that you have a hormonal contraceptive and then a non-hormonal contraceptive. And so contraceptives, when we're talking about these agents, why it gets confusing is that hormonal contraceptives are used in many different types of clinical settings outside of the um, intended, I guess the intent, not even intended use, but oh. the name describes okay. contraceptive, right? Um, and so when we think about hormonal contraceptives, Yes, uh, there are individuals that take them for reproductive planning purposes, aka not wanting to make babies. Um, but then there are also those that go on them for what I call either um, reproductive dysfunction, so heavy period, um, let's say heavy cramping or some type of uh, irregular cycle. And then there's also those that go on them that would be considered more under like a lifestyle purpose, which would be something like um, convenience sake or cosmetic, so acne. Now, the thing that is really important, I guess this for me is one of the key pieces of the conversation that's not being had often, is that when we, we have to strip back the layers and actually think about, okay, what is happening and why are, there's different, like, why are there different types of drugs? How are these drugs affecting the human body and why are people going on them in the first place? Um, I think the whole question of like, why are you going on it or why did you go on on it in the first place is really important to not only be able to help um, create healthier use if you're mm -hmm. staying on it or to be able to create a um, I guess a healthier and possibly easier transition off of it mm -hmm. if you're deciding to go off of it whether you've been on it for fertility reasons or some type of like dysfunction health dysfunction mm -hmm. reason so 
that in my mind is like really one of the biggest reasons why this topic is so bastardized, so contentious to research and why I was drawn to it myself. Um, let's just be honest. I, I love the shit storm. So, okay. Menstrual manipulation, reproductive planning is not the same as menstrual dysfunction. So that is always as a coach, as, a, as an individual, just remember that if you're wanting to prevent babies, there are other ways to do that than taking hormones if you show suits. So choose to do so. Now, if you have some type of dysfunction, reproductive dysfunction, hormonal, there are other ways to also go about um, improving the symptoms as well as the root cause of it that don't involve a hormonal contraceptive agent. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when we think about something like, let's say, um, having... Uh, I mean, heavy bleeding. There are so many different ways to actually facilitate having a lighter menstrual cycle without using some type of synthetic hormonal agent. Okay. So now with all that, there's also different types of um, agents as well, which also makes it complicated because with that kind of that, that, that category of hormonal contraceptives, we have agent types. So you have something like the hormonal IUD, the vaginal ring, the patch, the pill, the implant, the injection. So, and, and I mean, there's others, there's, there's new methods growing all the time. But if we're thinking about, so the, the still the most popular method is the pill itself. So the, the birth control pill, um, there's different types of that. So, I mean, if you think about almost like a, a flow chart of sorts, it's like, you, yeah, you start dividing and you keep dividing it and there's so many different trees mm -hmm. and, and, sides to go down and things like that. So, it, I mean, it's, it's fucking complicated, but the birth control pill. So the easiest way to look at this is you've got a progesterone only pill, which means that you're only ingesting a progesterone. So not progesterone, it's not synthetic progesterone. It's not progesterone replacement. It is a synthetic progesterone. And then you have a combined pill that's going to contain both estrogen and progesterone. And this is the most um, popular form of kind of, in, if we think about that two division. Underneath that combined contraceptive pill, there are different types of pill types itself. And we're not even talking about the agents itself. Yeah. We're just talking about pill types at this point in time. So basic, which means that you're taking the same dose of drug throughout the duration of the month. So your estrogen and your progesterone is the same. And then you usually have a placebo pack and then you start over new pill pack. Mm -hmm. There are biphasic, which means that you now have two different strengths of pills. And then you have your placebo pack. Now with the biphasic, typically speaking, what you see is that the progesterone will change, but the estrogen level will stay constant throughout the duration of the month. And then you have your placebo pack. Then there is a triphasic, which is three different strengths of drug. Same thing, progesterone will change uh, three different times. Estrogen doesn't. And then you have your quadphasic, which is um, four different types of, or four different strengths of hormones being used. And that is said to actually mimic the female cycle the best because you are having these highs and lows of hormones. Um, I got so excited, I dried my throat out. Um, we've got two more types. <laughs> there are the extended cycle, which deliver 91 days of hormones and you only get four bleeds a year. And then you have your continuous cycle, which means that you're taking pills all the time that are active pills. There's no placebo pack and you don't have a menstrual, like a, a bleed because of that. Now, you guys probably just heard me catch myself when I, cause I almost said menstrual and then I was like bleed cause it is not a menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have a bleed, when you are on a hormonal contraceptive, it is not a menstrual cycle cause you don't have ovulation. So go back and watch, I guess the, I like, go I back know, to the, fir the first video. First one. <laughs> um, uh, because if I was smart, I would know how to like link that up but I'm not sure if I know how to do that. So just click back and go see the other one. Yeah. So what we talked about is that in order for like a, a menstrual cycle to happen, you need to actually have not only like that uterine shed, the lining, but you also need to have ovulation. And so the whole goal of a contraceptive agent that's hormonal based is to stop the body from ovulating. I mean, that's the primary role, that's the principle. And so you know, regardless of what strength of pill that you're on, you are not ovulating, which means that you are not having a menstrual cycle. What is happening is it's a withdrawal bleed. It's kind of like if I were to say to you, Lauren, you're not allowed to have uh, coffee for the next like week 
about at day three, you're probably going to have withdrawal symptoms like headaches. Just day as a result. Three. Oh, you're really like, you believe in me, huh? I do. I do. I think the first couple of days you're going to be like, I got this. And then all of a sudden it's no. like, Whoosh. but anyways, your body has a physiological response, the absence of a substance that it's used to having on a daily basis. Um, I mean, same thing could be said if somebody is on, let's say, morphine post-surgery, and all of a sudden they just pull it away without doing proper pain management, their pain is going to be high. They're also going to have withdrawal symptoms of now not using that narcotic. Um, so you have these withdrawal, and in the form of uh, hormonal contraceptive agents, that withdrawal symptom is a bleed. It is not a menstrual cycle. It's merely the sloughing and the lining getting cleaned. You're cleaning your pipes. Um, and so... The basics of oral contraceptives are the progesterone is in there in order to prevent pregnancy. So the whole goal of progesterone is to stop ovulation by preventing fertilization, um, to thin the um, uterine lining to prevent implantation from happening, to thicken the cervix, which then will also prevent sperm from being able to actually enter the uterus. And now the estrogen, its role is to boost the contraceptive effects of progesterone to prevent ovulation and to actually help with um, the better cycle regulation. And so the more estrogen that the, the contraceptive contains, the less likely you are to have some type of breakthrough bleeding or spotting. Mm -hmm. So when we go back to that, that mini pill that doesn't have any estrogen, mm -hmm. this pill type is actually, it's the most kind of unstable out of all the different brands because you're not having any estrogen, which means you're more likely to have breakthrough bleeding as well as you're more likely to have, um, like the, the timing of the dose is really, really important. You don't have the same forgiveness that you do with, uh, uh, an agent that is containing estrogen as well. Um, so progesterone only low estrogen, even there's more of, I guess, it's unforgiving with those timing, mm -hmm. higher estrogen, the less chance of breakthrough, the better regulation of the cycle itself, but the more side effects that are associated with use because you're now taking in a higher amount of an exogenous substance. And so if we think about an anovulatory cycle, you're still creating estrogen, but you're not creating progesterone. We think about birth control itself, your body still creates estrogen from different sources. It's just not creating the same kind of ovulatory um, ovarian uterine drive of those hormones that we see with um, a normal menstrual cycle. So I guess the last kind of differentiating to kind of round out the different types of contraceptives are the fact that the actual hormones we're talking about are going to be different. So there are different forms of synthetic estrogen that is used in contraceptives. And there are different forms of progesterone, mm -hmm. um, which is called a synthetic progesterone. We call it a progesterone. So the spelling is different on it. Um, and these are going to do different things. And there's different side effects associated with different forms of either estrogen or progesterone. Progesterone is one of the ones that I find the most fascinating um, as a researcher because Essentially, when they were creating progesterone, they took two different molecules and they created essentially two different like derivative forms. So some progesterones, they have been derived from progesterone mm -hmm. and some have been derived from an androgen, testosterone. And so the molecular structure itself of both different forms do not look enough like a actual progesterone that our body makes for us to be able to call them progesterone. We call them progesterones. Um, and like I said, these are going to have different types of side effects and different types of, uh, I guess, unintended implications for the user, even when they go off mm -hmm. because of their, how they act in the body and how the body responds to them. Mm -hmm. And so if anybody out here has looked at some of the, I guess, the hogwash that's available online as it relates to um, contraceptives and yeah, everything else managing or what supplements you should take or anything else. It's really important that even this type of protocol has to be tailored to the individual. Yes. It has to be tailored to why you went on it in the first place. It has to be tailored to uh, what type of pill you're actually on, how long you've been on it, when you started it, mm -hmm. uh, were you on going on it because you were, you know, you had some type of abnormal uterine bleeding. Cause if you did the way that you want to go off of it, there's certain things you want to put in place before you even take that pill away. Mm -hmm. Um, I promise you're not Mine's boring me. I, I literally like can't stop yawning and it's not because 
Of course. Like when I'm on video, I'm just like, because <laughs> she ain't breathing. I'm like, man, this is so yeah. boring. I'm just totally kidding. <laughs> yeah. I, I know you don't like to breathe. Everybody's like, this is so, oh, ha, 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 ha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. Inside joke between Lauren and I, she does not <laughs> like to breathe. I get yelled at for all these things. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but she still loves me. There's literally like, what bothers me about that kind of advice is like mm-hmm. you said, it's not, it's not tailored and it's, mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's the same advice as you get from these like fake entrepreneurs. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I love how I'm just connecting these two, but it'll make sense. These people. Right. And they're like, drop your life. Uh, you know, follow your passion, move to California, just figure it out. Right. Like I equate that idea, mm-hmm. which is the worst idea I could think mm-hmm. of to, Hey, um, you know, you've been on birth control for this many years for these reasons. Does it matter? Just get off of it. Like, right. Like, mm-hmm. Hey, you can't just pull the plug on something like mm-hmm. that. There are a lot of things that need to be monitored and you should be expecting the next few months to not just like be an easy ride. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, what's so damaging. I think um, is when people make these blanket statements like, Oh, this is the best thing, or this is the worst thing. Yeah. And then, you know, people write a book and it gets published and everybody mm-hmm. reads it and, mm-hmm. you know, oh, we all feel mm-hmm. great about this, but it's yeah. like, <sighs> yeah. And, and if we go like, if we let's look at the research, the research on hormonal contraceptives um, have been contentious right from the get go. And so going back into like a little bit of where these drugs came from, synthetic estrogen and synthetic progesterone are essentially what we're talking about. And these are two steroids. They are steroidal compounds that can be used either on their own or together. Now, in either case, we have to remember that that's not mimicking the menstrual cycle at all. You're giving the body a synthetic compound. Mm -hmm. And that progesterone, one of the reasons why it doesn't look like progesterone that we create is that progesterone is a really unique, like it's got a very short half-life. It's a very kind of an unstable compound in our bodies. And so in order to try to create a more, um, I guess, control with a pharmaceutical agent. That's why they bastardized it and created a progesterone. Like it was a very intended impact and result that the pharmaceutical companies did to be able to elicit a, a specific response. And this was not anything to do with helping with ovulation. But both, if you want, or if you want to do something to um, like pharmaceutically for ovulation, it's got to actually mimic what your body's doing, not totally looks like a different, a different cat altogether. Yeah. So these, um, these drugs themselves, they have implications for the user um, that, I mean, any drug does. There's risk everywhere we look. You know, taking vitamin C for some people is going to cause certain types of risk. So it's it really important that, I mean, the risk happens even just walking outside, especially right now. Uh-huh. Yeah. Too soon? Too soon? Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. It's a, it's a serious thing. I mean, I have to say the coronavirus, we joked about it in the last one, but it is a very serious thing. And yes. trust me when I say it is not something that um, should be taken lightly, but we still have to find humility and some type of um, joy within life. So anyways, going back to that, <laughs> drug-nutrient interactions is one of the things that we have to look at, no matter if you're taking a hormonal contraceptive or other types of drugs, because other drugs also cause drug nutrient interactions. Um, Fun fact, when we metabolize drugs in our body, it takes certain types of properties to be able to do that. And if you're taking a drug every single day, those properties are going to get leached over time because that just the drug, in order to metabolize it, the body is using more of a certain type of um, nutrient. And now this can be both vitamins as well as minerals, antioxidants. And so that's just looking at the drug itself. We're not looking at what the drug is doing in the body. We're just looking at what, what does the drug require to do, um, to, to be able to metabolize? What is it interacting with on a cellular level? And so with a hormonal contraceptive agent, we see things like uh, B9, B12, B2, B6 reductions, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, um, vitamin D, vitamin K, as well as things like zinc and iron and copper. Um, sodium, selenium, calcium, uh, magnesium, potassium. So there is a lot of different factors that are being influenced as well as things like coenzyme Q10, which is an antioxidant. Um, and then there's also, I mean, we're, we're just talking about the drug nutrient interactions. There's also interactions that we're having with our liver itself, 
-hmm. obviously um for those that know a lot about like drug metabolism that yes oral contraceptives are being broken down in the liver mm -hmm. um they're pale but that there's also impact of having i mean intentionally unbalanced hormones that there's going to be nutrient interactions of that mm -hmm. there's going to be nutrient interactions from something like having high levels of say exogenous estrogen in our bodies there's going to be nutrient interactions from having um an anovulatory cycle mm -hmm. so there are it's it, that's what i mean like it is just really complicated i think one of the things when i when i teach this type of information it's like imagine this ball of yarn that's all tangled up yeah and you're trying to pick out one string and even if you grab that piece of yarn, nothing ha nothing gets, nothing moves. It doesn't come out. The ball doesn't take shape. Um, unlike what some people try to tote is that you take that piece of string and the whole ball just magically unravels. There's no knots. There's no intricacies. It's as simple as that. And it's just, it's not. Um, so silly so, to think that for really anything. Yeah. So why would, it be, why would it be so easy for this? Absolutely. Kind of like the, <laughs> what I don't understand. Yeah. And when we think about something like um, if somebody has let's say the, the research on it itself, looking at um, glucose metabolism. So it's really interesting because one of the things that has been kind of debated for a, a long time now is do these drugs impact glucose metabolism? Well, there's so many different variables that make researching this very, very complicated, such as what type of pill somebody is actually taking. Mm -hmm. So in some of the athletic studies that have been done on individuals that even um, untrained versus trained groups or kind of elite athlete status, they're not looking at a single type of hormonal contraceptive agent. They're not saying like, hey, everybody here is on a biphasic yeah. contraceptive, they're just utilizing saying, this perfect. form of estrogen and this form of progesterone. They're saying, okay, these are contraceptive users. And I'm like, that, that's, that's, that's bad research. That's not so only bad. that, they're not looking at how these people, you know, the, the pre, not before they went on, they're looking at them when they've sometimes been on it for years. They have all different types of sports that they're playing, which we know impacts glucose metabolism yeah. and homeostasis. They've got all different set points. They're not measuring things like inflammation. They're not doing longitudinal studies. Like the, yeah. the research on it is shit. And I can say that with confidence. Um, that the research in particular on athletes as it relates to contraceptives and hormonal contraceptives is absolutely, um, it needs a lot more work and a lot more attention. But I also will go back to what I always say in the fact that science is imperfect. And when it comes to a topic like this, the science is going to be imperfect. So we have to look at pathways. We have to look at just like what, you know, with methodology, we have to look at the theories. So how might synthetic estrogen influence blood glucose mm -hmm. just you know in a petri dish and yeah. then now let's look how it's going to do that in the body and then now let's look at how it's going to do it in an individual mm -hmm. that plays this type of sport that has this type of reproductive history that has all these other variables going on i mean sleep disturbances influence glucose homeostasis oh, yeah. so it um yes and no birth control can cause some people to gain weight mm -hmm. but again it goes back to what type of agent they're on yes and no so birth control factors. can cause um you know elevation or influences for um nervous system and central nervous system demand it can cause issues with blood pressure um and and it always though we have to go back to what's the root cause of these issues um and how do we then begin to manage them yeah um are, you I, know genetic predispositions and uh, absolutely you in your lifestyle um yeah. there's absolutely that's terrible research oh, oh. and i remember one of the things uh <laughs> lauren you and i talked about before was I was saying that I was noticing online that there were certain programs for, uh, you know, how to use contraceptive healthy. And they were giving people a shit ton of factors that literally was making them over metabolize the drug. So the drug now wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing because they, when they looked at either the lab work or whatever the person based their formulas on, they weren't taking into consideration that when you're on a compound like this, you are going to see some alterations. You're not going to expect to see somebody that has this perfect blood work that looks exactly like it did when they were off of it. Like it just, that just is not what happens. Um, and so it, uh, it scares me because now you could have somebody who thinks that they're taking something for, let's say contraceptive reasons and, uh, the drug's not, not, it's not doing its job anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so it's going to look a lot different. So just to go back to though, like, what are these drugs doing when we take them? Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, they have numerous implications, not mm -hmm. only because of the drug itself, but also the actions of that drug on the body. So what is it not allowing the body to do? And in this case, it's ovulating. Mm -hmm. So bone health, I bring up 
all the time because it's something that when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're not really thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually when you're, you know, in your 40s and 50s and potentially like, Shit. low bone density, you're then going like, oh, crap. So when you're not ovulating, we're not able to actually create um, the bone integrity that's required for later on in life because progesterone has such a profound impact on how we are able to preserve our bones. Now, as an exercising group, yes, we're going to be um, have that kind of positive impact of exercise and nutrition to help us out. But at the end of the day, if you're not ovulating, that is going to have potential long-term consequences. Um, we can look at things like brain health. There are research, um, I mean, it exists and it has existed since the pill came out onto the market in the 1960s on the impact for things like depression. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody who's on it is going to get depression. It just means that there has been found to have higher rates of depression mm -hmm. in certain users, in particular with certain types of pill, pill types, okay? Um, similarly, things like, um, I mean, thyroid dysfunction, that because estrogen has an, I mean, estrogen and progesterone have a, a really important um, impact on our thyroid, we're not creating enough progesterone it's not helping to preserve our thyroid and then estrogen also, there's some influence with how our thyroid binds. So there can be some issues for a user if they're on long-term and they're not looking at and trying to kind of optimize their thyroid in light of the drug that they're taking. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with, uh, I mean, antioxidants and oxidative stress. And so oxidative stress has been shown to potentially be altered in users, but that's something relatively benign that an individual can help to improve. I mean, if you know that a contraceptive agent hormonal is going to induce a lower total antioxidant capacity, eating a nutritious diet is going to go a really long way and actually being able to digest and absorb the nutrients from that diet. I mean, yes, there's other types of supplements you can take too, but that's the best place to start, right? We can't go all into these extremes. Um, taking something like DIM well on an oral contraceptive, I can say there's not research to support this, therefore the impact of doing so, we simply do not know. From a yes. theoretical perspective, does it make sense? Well, possibly if somebody has a higher estrogenic state, sure, balance them out, whatever, but from but again, a cellular- it's be changing just, stuff. Yeah, we just don't know the impact of that. Um, and fat loss is another great one. So does birth control impact fat loss? Again, it depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. It depends on their body, and how they respond. I have found personally within kind of the research and the data on this is that there are a lot of individuals that antidotally discuss and talk about fat loss. And it actually is one of the major reasons for why there's discontinuation. Mm -hmm. However, the, 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 the data that they've done on this, like I said, it's not the greatest. And so there are right. some people that go out there going like, oh no, there's no impact. We found no impact. And I'm going <laughs> like, okay, now let's look at what you're actually saying. You have this data set even systematic reviews that you're looking at research that's not the greatest, that had high withdrawal, that mm -hmm. had a high levels of people quitting, that also wasn't looking at these predisposing kind of factors. Um, a big area that individuals, I think in the last couple of years, started to talk about was the impact of oral contraceptives on androgen levels or testosterone. So yes, having synthetic estrogen in your body in particular and progesterone will impact um, how you're able to actually bind androgen. So something called your SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin. There's seen to be an increase, which means that your, um, your SHBG levels are higher when somebody is on a contraceptive agent than when they're off of it, um, as well as potentially decreased circulating levels of total and free testosterone. And that's because you're changing your ovarian axis and you're in your ovaries, you are creating testosterone. Now mm -hmm. you create testosterone though, also through your adrenals. You also are creating it through other kind of um, other areas in your body, such as your fat cells. So again, something like that, it's just not that simple to be like, you know, all contraceptives inhibit testosterone production. It's just mm -hmm. not true. Um, yeah, and again, I would say with clients mm -hmm. you know, to go back to that, like there's some people who they have, you know, they've been on a certain type and they really, really like it. Mm -hmm. There's other clients who will try that and they hate it and they have to switch yeah. to a different type. Um, so it's just really going to kind of depend on the person. Um, yeah. again, just like anything, there's going to be genetic predispositions to things and then there's going to mm -hmm. be environmental things. Yeah. So some people love the pill. Some people love IUDs. Some people yeah. hate IUDs. Some people want mm -hmm. the ring. Like it just kind of depends. And then as far as getting lean, mm -hmm. I've had 
numerous, I mean, like innumerable amount, lots and lots of clients, can't say that right word, lots of clients, we're going to not try and sound smart, lots of clients who have gotten super peeled on birth control, yeah. right? Obviously they weren't part of a research study, um, but it is totally possible. Likewise, mm-hmm. there's people who, who've had different side effects mm-hmm. um, and not necessarily even weight gain, but just yeah. these kind of downstream things yeah. that are affecting them, whether it's physiologically or psychologically, that is inhibiting that. So you can't really say one way or the other. So kind of like to Victoria's point, there is no one answer here. There's no one mm-hmm. Band-Aid. Um, we really just have to say, okay, hey, you know, what works for you, kind of going back to that first episode that we did, you know, tracking mm-hmm. things, like tracking mm-hmm. changes. You can't yeah. just be like, oh, this isn't working, and then be like, well, why? Oh, oh I don't know. Okay, so yeah. we need a little bit more feedback here. So if you're having any issues with something, you really, really need to write down feedback. Um, and this is particularly helpful. I just want to touch on it quickly because I know this is like a whole can of worms, but just mm-hmm. quickly, when you are trying to trans, if somebody is trying to transition yeah. off of control, what would be a few key things that you would say somebody yeah. should either do, not do, journal, whatever it might be yeah. to help? Well, so one of the great things that you need to do right from the get-go you just said, which is track. So start mm-hmm. tracking right away. Now, the other thing though is that this process is going to look different Forever. based off of things like when you started. That's a really key critical point. So if you started on a contraceptive agent in your teens, your reproductive kind of highway of sorts, the, the control signals from your hypothalamus, your pituitary, your adrenals, your ovaries, as well as the feedback loops, haven't necessarily had the time to develop. Mm-hmm. So they, there is um, theories and research to support that that can cause kind of some more issues when you go to come off. Now, if you start on it, say in your twenties and you've already kind of developed all these highways, these pathways, then that your, your, like the period of coming off might look different. Same thing. Like I said, if you went on it for a specific reason, always go back to that. That's really, really important. Like I said, if you're starting it because you have a, for contraceptive reasons, there are d- different non-hormonal options you can investigate and look into but just be aware that some individuals do regain kind of fertility. They have an ovulatory cycle within that first month or so coming off. Sometimes though, that data, I do have to question. I know it takes a while to make an egg, so it's a bit complicated. It's going to be different again. I mean, it's going to be different again for everybody. So tracking is first and foremost, what I'm going to say to suggest. Now, number two though, is time. Mm -hmm. This process takes time. Research has shown that it's an average of nine months to be able to regain an ovulatory cycle following the use of some type of hormonal contraceptive agent. Now, as I mentioned, if you've had any other pre-existing conditions, if you have you know, all those different pre inner dispositions that help to maintain hormone homeostasis in your body, if there's variance in that, if uh, you were on a, a, say, a hormonal contraceptive agent that had an progesterone that also had an anti-androgenic impact of it, your hormones and the way that they come back around are going to be different. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I recommend for individuals that are going off the pill. There are things you can do ahead of time, non-hormonal things. The last thing that you want to do as an individual who's either coming off or, you know, in the process of you've already decided that something you want to do, say you just don't know how to do it now or you're off and you're going like, hey, my hormones are fucked up, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Don't throw fire at fire. I say the same thing to competitors that have used certain types of hormonal agents or those that are post-prep and they're trying to regain some type of hormone homeostasis. Don't start with agents that are going to impact hormones right away. Mm -hmm. Work on the other system. So we know that um, there is an impact of hormonal contraceptives on the liver and liver health. So work on improving your liver health not so you're over metabolizing the drug really while well, you're still on it, but you know, basic type of things that are going to help with bile production, bile flow. Um, so, and then after you come off, maintain that, stay on that for the first couple months because you're going to help now clear your, help your body metabolize hormones uh, and excrete them. Digestion, make sure that you're pooping every day, women. Make sure you're pooping every day. I'm going to say that again because estrogen recirculates. So we need to make sure that if we're trying to maintain some type of hormonal homeostasis, and we know that we might have some weird flip-flops of estrogen as the body's trying to kind of regain an ovulatory cycle, that having that regular bowel movement every day is actually going to help create homeostasis. So, you know, looking at things like your diet, looking at things like sleep, 
because sleep can be altered by the menstrual cycle and reproductive hormones. And so doing what you can to try to create certain times that I call them like boundary setting. So what can I do to be able to anchor my sleep? So I've got to have a, a habits and, and, or even just steps to be able to help me go to bed at night. So what time I'm going to go to bed, what's my nighttime routine, that type of thing. And then also waking up because our neurotransmitters, it's our neuroendocrine system. So neurotransmitters also impact our hormones. Mm -hmm. What can I do from a physical activity standpoint to help? Well, I can tell you that if you've been off the pill for three months and your cycles are regular and now you want to compete, might not be the best time to do that because you're now throwing more variables into the mix. You're making it a lot harder on your body to try to regain some type of baseline, some type of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so typically when people go like, well, then when should I compete? It's like, try to get three ovulatory cycles down first. That would be great. I always because, try to tell clients who have lost their period to leave, like, yeah. let's try to get three. And then if three things ovulatory kind of cycles, out, yeah. Wow, yeah it's, better it's great. And all of the, all of the feedback that you just gave for, for getting yeah. off the cycle, because again, this is going to be a video yeah. that's not going to be something that, you know, everybody can take and apply right away. Hence, yeah. everything we've said is very, very individualized. But all the things mm -hmm. that you just talked about there are all lifestyle mm -hmm. things um, that we yeah. really can, you know, you can use to put yourself in the best situation. So making sure that yeah. your stress management is on point, making sure that your diet is on point with, you know, high nutrients, good quality food, sleep is on point, um, you know, mm -hmm. all these types of things, you know, taking certain supplements, you know, for liver function, et cetera, not too much, but yeah. You know, and I think that that is so, so key because anybody who is trying to regain any kind of hormonal balance, whether you're yeah. on contraceptives, whether you're not, whether you're trying to get off of them, getting on them, whatever it might be, those are really big changes. And the only way to actually be able to solidify stuff like that, like for you know, your body not going crazy, which it still might, yeah. but to kind of lessen those effects is to have everything else in place. Like you wouldn't yeah. want to be like, hey, I've been on birth control for you know, 10 years and I just came off of a 10 month diet. Uh, I think I'm going to get off of that now. Like, whoa, no, no, yeah. no, no. Your body can barely function right now <laughs> from a lot of other levels. Let's yeah. not just pull that rug out. Right. Or let's not add something in right away either. It's kind of something that should be, Hey, your body and your system should be in a really good place physiologically yeah. and psychologically. And then, yeah. you know, we can yeah. kind of work from there. Yeah. It's just more of a resiliency thing. Well, and I think one of the, one of the kind of buzz phrases recently in the last couple of years has been like women that have gone off the pill and that then are diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I know that's another topic. Maybe I'll come back and talk about it because it's super complicated. Yeah. But the thing is, is it's not necessarily um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I mean, that's a very complicated term and words and everything else. It's, I'm just going to say your body is adapting to a new state of having no longer exogenous hormones in it. And so for some individuals, there is a slow restart period. For some individuals, they can kind of have this androgen fluctuation. Like I said, if you were on a, a, a contraceptive that had a progesterone that was androgen derived, you might have high androgens and then all of a sudden they like tank and now you have low androgens. Now that doesn't mean that you're not going to make uh, adequate levels of androgens for the rest of your life, it means that your body has to figure it out. And so if all of a sudden you start throwing things like like testosterone pellets or DHEA into the mix, your body's going to get even more confused. And so this is where it is really important to work with a practitioner that has knowledge of the complexity to know that you're not broken at all. Your body has just had some type of influencing agent. Now, one thing I do um, suggest people to consider is that something like cramping can be a sign of, um, I mean, it's actually, it's you're always a sign of prostaglandin production, specific type of prostaglandin and also works with estrogen. And so a little bit of cramping is okay. But if your cramping is crazy, you got to get on that because then that over time is actually going to influence negatively the estrogenic feedback loops and things like that in the body. And so you know, having a little bit of cramping, especially if somebody's been on an, a hormonal agent for a long time. I've had women I've worked with that have been really excited. They're like, oh my God, Victoria, guess what? I cramped. I'm so excited. Like this coming back, this is great. And I'm like, were you incapacitated? Because if you were incapacitated, yeah. it's not necessarily what That's we want to see. It's a, it's a sign that your inflammation levels are high. Yeah. It's a sign that you're creating a lot of prostaglandins and it can be a sign though, therefore that you're now creating, creating more estrogen or at least mm -hmm. there's an estrogenic influence. And that then over time, if that's happening, you know, month one, month two, month three, the likelihood of you having an ovulatory cycle is actually 
kind of low because you're throwing off your hormonal balance. And so menstruation um, shouldn't be life altering or crippling. Mm -hmm. Yes, you should feel it. And if you don't, cool. I mean, awesome. Some women are like, yeah, it just surprises me. Uh, sometimes like, you know, I should get my period around this day, give or take three days. Um, but I'll just be at the gym and all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, yo, there you are. That some women, that's, that's them. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, other women, they get maybe a little bit more, um, they get a little bit of cramping, but the cramping should not be life alterating, mm -hmm. life alterating. Oh my God. Life altering. Uh, same thing with acne, like a little bit here and there can be a sign of everything's fine, but it can also be a sign that something greater is going on with your levels of estrogen, progesterone, and androgens. Mm -hmm. um, digestion disturbances or fluid retention or breast tenderness, all of these things, they can be really great markers. And that's why I actually suggest people don't necessarily just do a yes and no scale, like a lot of the apps actually do try to do. It's mm -hmm. not like, yes, you had cramps or no. Utilizing a grading yeah. can be really, really great to be able to actually say like, hey, I had two pimples on my chin. They were small. They weren't cystic acne. So that's like a one mm -hmm. out of, let's say five versus a five would be like, I had cystic mm -hmm. acne everywhere. Post ovulation. My diet was on point. Mm -hmm. There was no other reason why I should have gotten them. So yeah. kind of putting things in context, especially in that post pill, um, area and not just post pill, but post IUD, uh, like yeah. hormonal IUD or, Anything. or injection or, or whatever it might be. So I guess just to recap is that there are a lot of different things that the pill is going to do both from a hormonal kind of getting the hormonal balance back, but then also how it's influenced other systems in your body. Time is going to be your best tool and also controlling for lifestyle variables mm -hmm. to try to just create as much homeostasis for your body and compassion for your body too, mm -hmm. right? Like that goes a huge way. That's the same, honestly, advice that people have, the same advice for, you know, after really harsh diets and after all these big changes, mm -hmm. right? And people yeah. ask, you know, well, what can I do? What's this, whatever. We're really yeah. trying to control your lifestyle stressors. Yeah. I'm really trying to instill better habits. And then mm -hmm. third is literally time. And that's mm -hmm. the only thing that you yeah. can do, which really, really yeah. sucks. And everybody recovers differently. So some people, you mm -hmm. know, post diet, post show will recover in three months. Other people might take a year. So same thing is going to yeah. go for this. Um, and you might be somebody who has, you know, after three months, it's like you never yeah. even took any, you know, contraceptives. And then it might be somebody else, like over a year, they're still mm -hmm. dealing with stuff. So don't give up, you guys. Yeah. It's going to be a time thing. It's going to mm -hmm. be incredibly dependent on your situation, you know, like Victoria said. So if you are interested mm -hmm. in any more information from her mm -hmm. or doing consulting with her because she is amazing and she does offer that, give them the information on that. It is just at my website. So Victoria at victoriafelker.com. Yes. So do that. Send her an email. Go to her website. She's awesome with consulting. Um, I cannot recommend anybody more than her. So thank you so much for tuning into this series. If you want to hear more about kind of just menstrual health in general um, and just, you know, cycle changes, go to the first episode slash video um, and you can check that out. And if you have any questions for Victoria or myself, um, let us know on Instagram. Mine's at Lauren Conlon at Victoria Felker. There we go. Hopefully she'll check it. We're going to get her on social media more um, to share all this wonderful knowledge. But thank you so much for joining me. Again, we appreciate thank you it. for having me. Yeah. And we'll catch you guys next time.